Alrighty, it is the top of the hour. Uh, we'll give another two minutes just to let people wander in. It's not a huge amount of people around at the moment. I am accepting volunteers for a note taker. I am technically slightly sick, so it'd be good if somebody else would um, help out. I will try and help out as well. But. And oddly, we seem divorced from the data tracker today. So um, the documents aren't available in the in Meet Echo for some reason. I'm not sure why, because I definitely uploaded some slides. But uh, so people planning on presenting will need to present themselves or have me do it uh, from a slide deck just as a warning. Hey, was um, Thomas here? Uh, I think. Could, could you present my PDF? Because it, my computer never works with me, me Deco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> okay, Let me go Thank grab you. them. I will have to bug the tools team later as to why the documents aren't loading this morning. It's common when they don't load, like you upload them like at the same time as the meeting, but usually they're much better if it's uh, uploaded a long time ago, and they definitely were. So. All right, Thomas, I have your slides. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is, as you probably guessed, the Secure Asset Transfer Protocol Working Group interim meeting on April 9th, 2024, the day after an eclipse. Uh, this is an official IETF Working Group meeting, so we do follow the note well, uh, which means that you need to be careful about things you say with respect to IPR and things like that, uh, if you're unsure. Consult a lawyer. Uh, working group information, everybody attending here probably already knows all this. We have three documents sort of in flight at the moment, uh, mailing list and all of that stuff. Uh, the agenda today um, is fairly full. Um, the introduction and the last call responses are gonna go pretty quickly. Um, so that, that's the end of the introduction. Um, if anybody has additional things you wanna discuss today, uh, we can do a quick any other business people want to bring up that's not on this agenda? All right. Um, I think Claire is about half here, so do ahead and, you know, it's a small group, do ahead and, and unmute uh, if I fail to see your hand in a, in a queue fashion, by the way. Um, quick note about last call responses. So two weeks ago, we put out a call for, four weeks ago, we put out a call for last a working group last call on the um, the architecture document. Um, I have reviewed those. Um, I don't have a slide for this. Sorry. Um, we reviewed those comments. Uh, there was a good discussion about security considerations and whether um, some additional work was needed there. And we'll, we can open the floor to talk about that in a minute. But um, given the lack of general responses, there was really only two or three. Uh, Claire and I have decided let's extend the call for another two weeks. Um, what that really means is a couple of things. One, uh, you know, if anybody, if you haven't had the chance to read it, you know, uh, there's a little bit more time to do so. And two, if you have read it and you support its publication, you should say that even if you have no other comments. Um, having a document go forward that only has a couple of people saying they support it going forward really isn't enough. We need more part working participants to be able to um, to support it. So uh, please consider at least writing in and saying, you know, it's good from your po point of view and it should go forward. Um, having said that, I think we'll need an update um, with respect to the security related discussions. Um, there is uh, just a bit uh, IETF history wise, 
it is common to put a decent security consideration section in the document. Um, sometimes there is a separate document that discusses security, a security threat model. Um, so that is entirely up to essentially the document authors of whether they would rather roll it in there or not. Um, so I will leave that up to the group. Does anybody have comments or thoughts on the? You know, I know that that Thomas, you actually uh, or somebody read the document with um, some new sections about the security consideration. Um, I guess what I'm really wondering today is, does anybody feel that that discussion is unresolved from their point of view? I don't. I <laughs> I I don't feel comfortable with going ahead with the architecture document. And with the uh, I, with the security as it is now. Okay. Um, thanks, David. Um, what do you feel is the is needed the most in in that regard? You know, I mean, some additional text was put in. I think you wanted to see something I, uh, significantly more explicit. I. Well. I'm not. I'm not. You know, I don't feel. <laughs> I'm not. I don't feel I'm an expert on this uh, technology, so I can't specify all the potential threats although even just looking at a, our message exchange protocol you see points at which their security vulnerabilities i feel that experts could see uh <laughs> many more and i many i think some of some of the mitigations for those security threats probably would involve interaction between the gateways and i just uh <laughs> you know it's, it's just a feeling that we sort of so, have to consider this a great deal more before we say the architecture document is complete. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I, I will say that there are two different sides to the security threat issue, right? So this is the architecture document, not the protocol document. And there's a very different set of um, of analysis that needs to happen there. But um, the architecture document certainly should have a decent enumeration of here are the weak points in the architecture that need to be fixed by the protocol or something like that. Um, okay, uh, thank you, David. Anybody else have comments? Uh, all of this, will, of course, we'll go back to the list. Thomas? Oh, uh, actually, <laughs> uh, thank you, David. I actually agree 100% with David. Uh, and also, um, you're right, um, Wes, there's actually two places where we need to talk about this. So there's the architecture document and um, we need to add like a security threats, security and threats section towards the back, just to convey to the reader that uh, we are aware of the possible attacks uh, that are actually uh, stemming from the two phase, three phase commit protocol. I mean, it's this is, you know, 40 years old now. And so people are very aware about, you know, how you could disrupt a, a two phase a commit. <clears throat> so that's one one whatever se section you know half a page a page in the architecture now for the um satp core yeah i mean i agree with, with david we, we need to add stuff you know considerations threat considerations to the end of satp core because that is the protocol document and that's where all, like all this you know signatures uh, over claims signature over receipts and all that stuff so so yeah um you know uh, definitely we need help from people to so break break SATB core, please. Like you know, go through it, and um, we we can talk about it. You know, later on when when I present the update. But yeah, I, I agree absolutely. All right, thanks, uh, Thomas. Yeah. So in particular, um, what what I'm hearing is is there's definitely um, we need to spin on the architecture document for a little while longer, and. Uh, there's multiple people that believe that there are additional security considerations that are needed for that document. And then, of course, there will be more for the core document, which isn't yet near last call, but it's it's closer. So um, I hear that loud and clear, and, I, and Claire and I will talk about it. My guess is um, that the result of the last call will essentially be not quite ready yet, but we've identified additional things that are needed, and we will um, we'll put it you know back into a... a a state of, of not yet ready for publication to the AESG yet. Uh, any additional comments? Otherwise, we will go on to the core document. 
All right, seeing none, uh, Thomas, uh, it's up to you. I will share your document. Sure, thank you, uh, Wes. Go ahead and start talking for a minute. Yeah, so uh, a quick update on uh, uh, SAP Core. So um, uh, uh, Wes uh, actually um, submitted a number of very good comments, and we're still going through it. But um, one of them was just simple um, uh, re relaboring, renaming the APIs, because Originally, we had called you know three types of APIs: API type one, type two, type three. But then, when we were doing the network identifier documents with Wager, we started saying, uh, uh, "What is it? Uh, address type one, address type two." So the word type one, type two, type three was like going to be very confusing to people. And so we said, "Why, why don't we just call it API one, API two, API three? So it's just a quick. Uh, relabeling, renaming of the APIs. Number and number two, our our, our focus for SAP Core is in fact the interaction, you know, through API two. And so what we did was to move um, the the entire discussion about you know API one and API three to the appendix. Um, really, because we don't want to lose the text and we don't want to lose all the work that's gone into it. And so it's kind of in the appendix right now, uh, and the working group would need to figure out, you know, going forward, uh, what do we do with this? Do we have a separate draft on each of the APIs? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I personally believe we need to, you know, have somewhere maybe a separate document on API one and API three, because uh, that's that needs to be standardized, right? Um, particularly API API one because it's on the gateway side. Uh, API 3 is going to be difficult because, for example, if Gateway G2 was, you know, validating the sender, the, the originator and beneficiary, you know, identities, be it, you know, X509s and VCs and so on, it has to call out to some off-net resource and that off-net resource or service will all probably already have its own API definition, like you know whether it's OAuth, OpenID Connect, whether it's you know um, the you know X509 uh, you know validation you know services. So, but but that's that's kind of you know a future work. Uh, next next slide, please. Uh, can I stop you there for one question? Yeah, yeah, please, uh, yeah, yeah, jump in. Anyone can. Yeah, so I mean, all of that makes sense. The, um, the the one remaining question that I have is API one and three, um, and you may think of names that aren't you know numeric, but we can't specify them now. They're out of scope. So are you wording the document in such a way that this is essentially you know future work, um, and most importantly. API 2, which is really the core document, will work regardless of whether there's standardization between the rest of the APIs, right? That's right. Yes. Yes. So, so, so correct. This, this is out of scope. Uh, it's more like a reminder the call to folks, you know, like, help us, you know, deal with API 1 and API 3 because that's future work. Okay. David, yeah. do you have a comment? Yeah, it's just, I was just wondering a, a question on the diagram. Uh, isn't the client on network? Well, on the network, <laughs> I mean, the implication is it's not from the diagram, right? So, so the the client. So, there's two versions of this diagram. Actually, so there's the sender. So, there's the originator client. So, this is a human being driving, you know, an application and say an enterprise application, and is talking to its, you know, gateway. Whether it's a gateway that it runs or it's, you know, run by a service provider like like Swift. So it's 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 a real application. So therefore, another version of this diagram is that there's the there's client one and client two. You know, so the, there's the user A and user B. And I think I think David, you've probably seen this for user A and user B, and they're both talking to their own gateways through API one. And I think um, if you remember Dennis presented you know this interesting diagram where in fact. Uh, the expectation in the real world would be that uh, there is a uh, out of band um, sort of uh, dialogue interaction going on between user A and user B, 
to to essentially negotiate. Like I want to send you this asset of this class and so on and so on. So so all of that happens out of band, and once the application, you know, app one and app two agree about this, then they invoke the gateways through API one, and that's where SAP B sort of kicks in. Uh, but yeah, yeah, no, uh, I we could we could we could put another version of this where there are sort of app, app one and app two. Um, uh, are, are you saying that someone who's not on, say, net, network NW1 can access the gateway? Uh, 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 we're saying that you can access G1 either directly um, from app, app one through API one to gateway one, uh, or you can uh, send some kind of a local transaction on network one, NW1, that it will be detected and picked up by G1. So both both models occur to that's what ha what is happening today in, in out there, but it's out of scope for SATB. So we we can't say, you know, we you know both modes. There's probably three or four different modes of how gateways. Yeah, yeah. So that could happen. Thank you. Who's this? Is nice. Who's 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 the who's the, where's are you drawing this? That, that was mine. I was I was oh, just marking, up, the, oh. marking up the PDF slides. Oh, awesome! But no, this is this is good. This is this really is what good. David is saying, right? The yes. client yeah. actually is inside the network, and we can Correct. rearrange to do that. So. Correct. Yeah, yeah. For for simplicity, we've just put it out. And say, okay, here it's it's talking through API one. That's right. Yeah, but but that's a good point. We could change the diagram so that the client becomes inside the network. Um, um, so, uh, Thomas, sorry, sorry for interrupting. I disagree with the fact of putting the client inside the network. It may not be the case at all. There might be applications that actually are uh, running in a different, completely different environment that they may have an interaction with network one, but they not necessarily be inside network one. Well, so there's. So this is where we get into a confusion, right? Because when, when the network here is not necessarily the logical internet related network, it is the uh, network with respect to the asset ownership network, which may or may not be overlaid onto an IP network. Uh, we're, we're duplicating the usage of the word network, which is actually kind of a problem. Yes. Should, uh, on, on that one, should, should, should we call it just asset network? Like, like, put the word a. I don't want to say a a a s s In some slides in the past, we use also the the word system there, but uh, maybe even more confusing. But I don't know. I mean, there is something that definitely network one manages the asset. Now, whether the client is part of this asset network or not. I believe that it would be too constraining if we put the uh, the app client up inside the network. Actually, it works only if it is a DLT, and the client is some sort of smart contract eventually, but it may not be the case at all. So we can run a you know like a typically you have asset custodians that may managing the asset network, and the clients are in a different, completely different network or system. No, no, it's uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Dennis. No, that's that's right. This is this is the difficulty is we're trying to convey uh, something that that is complex on the other side, just between the client application and the interaction with with the asset network or the gateway. Both are both are possible, both models. And so, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, if, uh, Dennis, if if we fix the diagram to include that green arrow. Um, you know um, yeah yeah that, that might definitely yeah, be yeah. the case i think, I think, right. I think when, yeah so i think let's when take this this problem yeah. to the list we are going to run out of time and i want to give uh, both rama and alexandru a, a, a last chance to comment but then we'll move on I, I think that we have a direction and a path forward and a discussion that needs to happen on the list which is the purpose of a meeting so rama uh thanks Liz. yeah i was actually going to say what uh, something similar to what dennis said um, the the way these networks are architected, your clients are completely separable from the network, which is really the asset management and transaction processing uh, engine. Uh, but yeah, we can have the conversation later. So I think the way this diagram structured is actually okay. Uh, on the early question that uh, 
uh, Thomas was asking, uh, AP, both API 1 and API 3 are excised only in stage, uh, I mean, API 1 is excised in stage 0, right? And API 3, I'm not sure where it's excised, but it's probably uh, somewhere outside. So I think uh, uh, stage 0 was anyway not meant to be within the scope, right? So I don't know if uh, we need to, do we need to even talk about it in the appendix or should we just create another draft uh, futures uh, like you know we have other drafts that we've created for uh, future consideration we should probably put it in there yeah uh, I, well, terrific i hear a volunteer for someone to write um, a draft on stage zero <laughs> well sure. played thomas uh yeah so yes that's, yes that's I, volunteer. I volunteer for that sorry uh, yeah oh. I, I yeah i take that Maybe yeah, thomas yeah no and, because agree dennis uh, yeah yeah, Rama and Dennis can work together on that. Multiple authors is always a good thing. But yes, that's a future document for future uh, charter items. Uh, Alexandru, and then we'll move on to the next. Yeah, slide. most most of what I wanted to mention has already been said. But essentially, yeah, it does make a difference whether a client is inside the network or outside the network. Um, but both should be possible. Um, so we'll take that on the mailing list. Uh, probably we can have uh, two options for the diagram, one with the client inside, one, one outside. Yeah, both options enable different use cases, as uh, Rama and Dennis said. Okay, great. Uh, you want to go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, yes, please. Th thanks, Alex. Uh, next slide. Oh, actually, this is just the the words of what I just said in you know verbally. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah. So the other uh, change, I'm I'm, I'm reading <laughs> I'm reading through the text that I wrote whatever six months, and I like who wrote this? This is awful. So. Um, so I said, I'm going to fix it. So basically, um, there, there was um, multiple descriptions, words for the same thing. So I said, let's let's just be very specific. And so gateway signature public key pair is mandatory. So this is the key pair that is used by the gateway to sign claims and to sign receipts that are uh, has obligation. It could it could incur legal and financial obligation, right? So this is unique per gateway. So that's you have to have this mandatory. Uh, second one that we assumed away, of course, in in and in also in many other documents, is this: the gateway may use a different key pair to establish a secure channel, such as a TLS um, channel. Right, uh, and and because it's a uh, it, the session. Thomas, I lost your audio. You might mute and unmute. Thomas, no audio from you. Can you mute your microphone and then unmute? It might be a meet echo site, otherwise it's a little local site on your side. <laughs> Uh-oh, Thomas crashed. There we go. He's back. Still don't hear you, Thomas. Seems like you're trying to talk, but I don't actually hear audio. You might completely reload the red, yeah, rejoin, exactly. OK, uh, can you hear yeah. me now, folks? Now you're good. Go, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, and the other uh, remaining key pair is uh, optional. So, if if a gateway wants to use some hardware device identity that's you know bound to the actual physical hardware, great. It's optional, but we want to put text there to recognize that some some of this heavy duty you know banking systems actually have this capability, and then also optional, maybe even con you know contentious, is that. Uh, we've always worked with the assumption that that gateways and gateway services are run you know by somebody just like 
you know, routers are owned by ISPs. And so it could be that there's some mechanism in the future in the gateway where you can fetch, you know, do a get or read of the, you know, say uh, X509, you know, certificate of the owner, the business owner of the gateway so that you can, you know, you can see, okay, it's a, it's a legitimate business. It's got an LEI, you know, legal entity identifier number. It's got a business number and so on and so on. But, but those, la the, the last two are like optional. So if, um, if I'm missing anyone, folks, uh, anything, please let me know. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, so this is just a quick, you know, text consistency thing. So this is version 19 of the flow diagram. Uh, I'm gonna update it to version 20 and let, let people know. Uh, and it's up on, the, on both uh, GitHub repos now. Uh, thank you, Raphael, uh, very diligent of you to actually make a copy. But we're moving uh, just the, the flow. So basically the dotted red line for stage two just moves up by two flows. So now sort of officially transfer commence and act commence is part of stage two. Whereas, you know, uh, for the last couple of years, we've just loosely assigned it to stage one. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's my update. Um, where's that? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Uh, one, anybody have questions or comments? Otherwise we're a little over time, but, uh, I'll remind everybody that this, uh, the, the, the active working group documents always take precedence time-wise. So. All right. Uh, thank you, Raphael. I will go look at your. I'll, I'll go find your slides, but in the meantime, um, Rama, you have the next. Sure. Uh, thanks, Wes. I, I don't have anything to present. I just wanted to give a quick uh, update so I can do that verbally. So um, if uh, everybody remembers, I mean, there was a fair amount of uh, back and forth on the mailing list uh, in the last quarter of last year and, and some in January uh, around new use cases. These are proposed by uh, Peter Chunchi Lee and also by uh, Victor Zhao. And uh, uh, so uh, after having a quick discussion with Thomas, uh, I have uh, I've added some text to the uh, use cases draft representing uh, three specific, just calling out three specific scenarios. Uh, one of them being uh, a scenario around uh, an um, uh, excising stock options, which uh, uh, does not bring out a new flavor of uh, SATP, but it, it just illustrates how the uh, flavors of SATP that uh, we've shown as can be used in the trade scenario or in the financial uh, delivery versus payment scenario can also be applied for excising stock options. So it, it's just a somewhat more complex uh, derivative trading scenario. And uh, I think it does add some value to the, uh, to the use cases draft. Uh, so that's one use case. There's another one where uh, we, uh, we had earlier talked about, we had a use case around uh, trade of uh, digital art across networks. And uh, to that, uh, I added another use case uh, involving the payment payments for or pay as you go for uh, streaming services where the, there's a content uh, streaming network and there's a payments network separate. And... Uh, we need some way of uh, fulfilling uh, the uh, of ensuring that uh, whatever content is bought on the content streaming network is paid for on the payments network, and that has to happen in coordination. So uh, that's a, a use case for interoperation using SATP modes as listed in the architecture draft. Uh, and finally, there was the use cases around uh, the DNS records, uh, 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 which is a proposal really to uh, add some kind of uh, or augment the EPP uh, or the extensible provisioning protocol, uh, which uh, I, I kind of uh, realized uh, somewhat belatedly. But uh, that uh, use case, which I think Wes, you gave a lot of great comments, and uh, Victor also had responded on the on the mailing on the mailing uh, list. Uh, there, the way we are pitching it as a as a use case, because um, uh, as you guys discussed, this uh, this use case is. Uh, can be quite complex, and it, one might, uh, upon reading, uh, think that this requires a complete overhaul of the DNS architecture or, or the EPP uh, protocol as currently specified in the RFCs. But how we are framing it, uh, we can frame it, is uh, say is showing that uh, 
just like the SAPI protocol is really a, a provides support for other kinds of protocols, which uh, you know you have two networks or, or two apps that are trying to negotiate something. That negotiation sort of happens in stage zero, and uh, the part where the tokens have to be or or rather an asset has to be completely transferred from one network to another is what the two gateways are trying to fulfill. That happens in stages one through uh, one onwards. So we are framing this as uh, the EPP. If if the uh, registrars and the registries uh, actually wish to uh, maintain uh, DNS records on uh, distributed ledgers, then they can have a more secure uh, and safe way of uh, 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 ensuring coordinated EPP updates whenever uh, a domain has to be transferred from the purview of one registrar to another registrar in a different network. And uh, that if, if you actually meet that uh, scenario, then SACP is, is, quite a, quite a, uh, is quite crucial to that. So that's the way we are framing it. So I will uh, make some updates and I'll also uh, send the notification to the mailing list. So I would like people to uh, uh, comment on that. Uh, just see what you feel about the text. If you feel that the use cases are compelling, uh, if you feel that the use case actually detracts from the main purpose of, of SATP, then uh, we probably should not have them. But uh, this is the update I wanted to give. So three use cases. All right, thanks, Rama. Um, if anybody has questions, please, now's a good time. Um, so I guess, Rama, from a chair's perspective, one piece of advice would be remember that the use case document is does not need a extreme level of detail, right? It doesn't need to solve the problem. It's really uh, the, you know, that the, the, the SAP protocol could possibly be used in these contexts. So um, it, with respect to Victor and my conversation about, you know, uh, how, how well that will work, um, it's just fine to, to not have to go into the level of detail that he and I were going into about whether or not it will work. That's a future, you know, uh, problem to be solved. But um, I think you know that already. So. Understood. Thanks. Yeah, we are framing it uh, as a, a motivating use. Yeah. Okay. Just, just a actually quick procedural question was, I mean, ca can the use case document, um, you know, proceed ahead into last call before architecture and, and core gets to last call? Uh, technically, yes, it can. Um, so a couple of things. One, the use case document probably ought to reference the architecture um, because it's yes. sort of, it, you know, it's it's uh, would be an isolation otherwise, uh, but yes. Yeah, so the IETF has a has notions of uh, holding public final publication until a uh, until all the references have been handled. So there are times where internet drafts have actually just sat around for over a year or even longer, just waiting for the a document that they're referencing to be published. So they end up being grouped together in the RFC editor stream. Um, so that's well handled by by the IETF you know, process entirely. So don't worry about that. Um, uh, just put the reference in and that'll actually automatically trigger a hold. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, hearing nothing else, uh, Thomas, you wanna give us an update on the identifier design team update, which I know probably doesn't have slides, and you said, well, it'll be 10 minutes either, so great. Cool. Yes, uh, so uh, I think um, uh, the the status, um, uh, so, so maybe about a month ago, six weeks ago, there was an email from Wager that explained in, in actual text on the email, uh, um, the, the design, the update, the design of the network identifier, identifying scheme, uh, and so the next thing for us, for Weiji and I to do is to actually update the draft, you know, uh, move the text from the mailing list to the draft. And so that, that's that's on our plates uh, to do. Um, one item that was still um, uh, open was that um, for the type three address, so okay, this, uh, you know, this is, this is for um, monolithic uh, systems. So um, this refers to either databases or real-time RTGS, real-time gross settlement systems, uh, and particularly in the banking sector, they have the BIC number, big number. And so um, in a different discussion, a different forum, I actually asked um, the folks from, from SWIFT and a couple of banks there, 
And the way they architect it is that the big number is an institution address, right? So it's it's not tied to a particular endpoint or a particular gateway. And so uh, this, for me, remains a, a sort of an a open question. It, we want to retain the BIC number or, or you know the ISO 220 number uh, numbering, which is which is less far less than 32 bytes, uh, which is what what we need. And so the question is, what um, preamble and what what postamble do we put for Type Three addresses so that it could be used by um, by the, the existing uh, infrastructure, the banking infrastructure, that that's that's ongoing. Uh, like we we have to talk and consult uh, more people to to get just input and and just understanding. Uh, but the, for the type one address and type two address, I think we are clear, and it just now requires me and Weija to find time to um, to update the draft. All right, uh, that makes sense, Thomas. So it, it seems like um, I'm trying to determine where we are path forward, right? Right. It seems like the design team, to a large extent, is done with respect to sort of coming up with the core structure. And I would suggest that what you have be written up and it can go finally back to the working group as not a completed item, but but you know you've you've worked through the core issues and the core structures, and then the working group can of course iterate um, and decide, you know, how to handle some of these more nuanced problems at the working group level. Does that seem like a fair thing to do? Uh, yes, and I don't know if if um, Dennis has put in a lot of time here because it gets even more complicated because uh, there are structures such as you know DIDs and so on that you know would need to be described, but. But yeah, where's that's kind of the uh, plan, you know, going forward for the next like two months or three months is first thing is up, update the draft, and then right. you know have have it have the discussion again on you know on the mailing list. Well, and and from my understanding of the of the space, uh, which I admit is limited, and I'm sick, so I'm not thinking super clearly, but essentially. You know, you have three starting identifier enumerated types with details behind them. You know, future types can be easily added and extended. Um, and I would expect, you know, after the first document goes out with this typing kind of information in it, you know, future extension modules could define new things where, you know, DIDs don't fit in the existing three types. Just bad example, but yeah, yeah. Uh, new ones can uh, new ones can be created in the future. So. Yeah, that's right, and 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 I know um, we've we've written things as if it's a TLV, but we actually want to do things in CBOR. Okay, so the, <laughs> this is another TBD. The, the first thing you want to do is get agreement on the structure of the 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 semantics of you know the addressing before we actually like transcribe it in like CBOR format. Right. Okay. Great. Uh, any questions to Thomas about the? Identifier design team update. If not, we will switch to Dennis then and the asset transfer description. Yes, so <clears throat> to link it to the, the architecture, maybe we can bring the, you remember the, uh, the, the API 3 thing? So there is an access from the gateway to an external system in order for the gateway to be able to verify that all the things that have been negotiated, all this information that is required could be somehow verified. So the uh, one thing that is essential from what all the discussion that we have here is to be able to retrieve definition of assets, retrieve identifications of parties, uh, make sure that we can access keys or, or other things that are necessary in order to be able to verify that uh, uh, the owners are those who actually pretend to be the owners and the gateways can really transfer the, uh, the assets and all of that. So there is this notion of in the off-net resource, uh, as we see here, there is this notion of registries that uh, we're discussing and there is a, a draft uh, document that may, maybe I can put the link uh, into the, the chat here. Maybe you would be able to display that. 
uh, Wes. Oh yeah, if you want to, you want yeah. to display it. So, yeah, go ahead. Or, or or actually, yeah, I, I don't know what I can I can share the screen or. Maybe oh, I see. You, you can open. Uh, yeah. yeah, either way, either way. Yeah, please go. Yeah, if if you could. Uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> the one that looks like that you have the document right yes okay. so if you go there is a sequence diagram down below that shows an example of um, one of the resources that might be necessary uh, not that, that one that. The, the sequence one so one of the resources that are yeah that's it so you see the 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 third uh, swim lane here is the registry. So the registry is the one off-chain resource that might be accessed by the gateways in order to be able to fetch the definition of the asset, so the asset profile. This sequence diagram shows uh, how this uh, asset profile is registered and how the asset profile is used to issue instances of asset inside networks. So there is what we call the, the schema authority which is the party organization or, or whatever company that actually manages the definition of the asset profile so typically let's say that we are in a given jurisdiction and we have an authority that gives the right as we say the token um, uh, issuance uh, authorization here to create assets for a provider in a given network so the registry is used there to be able to capture that information saying that I am a provider and I have the authorization from a given authority in my jurisdiction to create assets in a given network because we want all these things to be third party uh, independently verifiable especially accessed by the gateways we have this notion of registry here so as part of the API 3 there would be a link between the gateway and the registry, for example, to fetch asset profiles. So in this document, we give the overall structure of what are the asset profiles and how the registries could be used in order to store the information that is necessary for the gateways uh, to execute the various transfers. So if we have that, there is what Rama also said, it's about stage zero. So during stage zero, you most probably gateways would access information stored in registries and they will negotiate either between uh, client apps or uh, before starting uh, the, uh, the stage one in order to be able to access the various things so, so here's the profile here's the network i am accessing a specific asset as a gateway so i can verify that the issuer of the asset is has the authorization to issue the asset on the specific network etc etc so the structure that we are uh, defining here in this document with uh, with Thomas is what is the asset profile, how it gets stored, what is the connection between the registry and you know the overall architecture of SATP, and this will all go at some stage in the API three um, definition somehow. I don't know, Thomas, if you want to jump in and, and say a few words about that. Yeah, yeah, I was about to type. It's probably. Uh, quicker if I say it <laughs> verbally. So, yeah. so this is the scenario where, uh, as we have been describing in stage zero, if gateway two receives a transfer proposal that has all these uh, claims, you know, it's this asset ID, it's this asset class, it's from this, you know, originator, and so on and so on. Uh, uh, gateway two may be operating in a jurisdiction. Uh, and and you know on behalf of a network that uh, is re that only deals with say regulated assets, and so Gateway Two might say, okay, I have to check this all the claims in this proposal of stage zero. I have to check this, and one of the items that needs to be checked is is the asset recognized and acceptable in the network two that runs in jurisdiction two. And the way to do this, one way to do this is for gateway two to reach out 
and, and basically inquire or, or do a get or read from a registry somewhere that has the uh, you know definition of the asset, which is what we've been calling you know the asset profile, and that's a digitally signed document you know in CBOR or JSON that's signed by somebody, which is it could be a local government, it could be a local consortium. And so th this is an, a good example of API 3, where the gateway actually has to talk to a registry. And so I think what, what, what we have as an opportunity is to define uh, the functions for the registry and also the API that the registry, a registry would need to set up, um, you know, stand up so that gateway 2 can actually talk to it. And, and interestingly, this is, you know, Wager is also interested in this because the, you know, the same problem is being discussed in the, you know, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, EEA, uh, because they, they kind of see, well, you know, it's nice to talk about taxonomy of assets, but, but we need the infrastructure to validate some of the claims about a digital asset. And so this is where, where Dennis and I are heading is that this diagram actually talks uh, uh, you know, basically what I would call even before stage zero in our language. This is this is the asset provider talking to the government saying, okay, you know, we're going to be publishing this schema for, you know, digital assets, uh, tokens, you know, tokenized gold, whatever, whatever you want, right? And so, um, uh, De Dennis, one of the things we could add perhaps later on in the document is an example of how Gateway 2 Pings the register. Absolutely. So, so there is pending to this action that we, I mean, to this document is how the gateway interacts with the registry. So that would definitely be something that it would be probably most probably necessary for stage zero, because the gateways have to somehow access the register and verify some information be before they trigger uh, stage one and, and the other steps. So this is definitely something that uh, we need to complement that with, with this. Now, the other thing also is that typically the registry could be the place where we can store typically network identifiers or other things. Um, keeping in mind also that because of different uh, jurisdictions, there might be also different several registries and not only one registry that captures all the information. Uh, thanks. Quick question from from my side. Uh, it might be helpful in this diagram to show sort of where the gateway is. I mean, so mm -hmm. I believe that the network block is essentially the gateway at the same time. Is that correct? No, the, the network is uh, actually, as you see the in step five, the network is, is really NW1, for example, if we relate that to the architectural document. So okay. this is whatever is necessary <clears throat> for someone to create assets in a specific network. We need to okay. identify what is the semantics of the asset somehow and having the definition of what is the structure of the asset in a registry. Um, and then you would be able to issue whatever asset uh, instance you want on a specific network. The thing is that we need somehow to have all this information verifiable by third parties. So it should be open and accessible. That's the notion of registry, basically, that it captures all the uh, the artifacts that are necessary for SATP uh, to work and the gateways to negotiate uh, before executing the, the transfer. At least in a publicly verifiable network, right? So, yeah, okay. all for those who have credentials to access the registry under specific, you know, sure. uh, circumstances and, and with credentials then definitely there also might be the same architecture but with more uh, uh, restrictions on the accessibility of, of the register of course okay anybody have questions for dennis rama uh, dennis uh, a long time ago we were thinking about the registry as a dead registry weren't we uh, are you still thinking that the, the registry it's something that uh, can host whatever artifacts are necessary for gateways so for example i mean if i link it to the previous discussion about the network ids a registry could be a perfect place where you can store the identification of networks for example so mm -hmm. whether the network 
identifier could be um, you know a did or something else it is something that could be defined in a specific profile because then we can say okay this is an artifact that defines a network uh, identifier for example so we can use this structure to to define whatever assets are necessary for for satp to work if i understand your question yeah yeah i mean the reason i asked the question was that i think uh, uh, thomas uh, api3 is supposed to hit the registry right yeah yes yeah, yeah. so, uh, api3 you said sorry sorry again yeah api3 yeah, so right now API3 is, is generic, right? But but yes, one of the endpoints that a gateway has to be able to talk to is a registry for the asset schemas. Okay, so I was just wondering, I mean, if, uh, if, the, if the registry is, if we just mandate that it be a did registry, could we just use the W3C specs and not have to create our own? Well, that, that would be wonderful <laughs> if the world was yeah. that straightforward. <laughs> But yeah. if you talk to the you you know EU regulators, they will say like, "What's a did registry?" So the registry is not necessarily a did registry. It's yeah. a registry of the artifacts that are necessary for SATP. So typically, an asset profile that we're going to also to specify, uh, maybe in this document or a separate document, is defines the structure. Maybe, for example, in a JSON LD, uh, on what is the what is the the asset. Uh, mm -hmm. definition and it might not be you know something related to a party like a did so it can doesn't have to be uh, an identification of an organization or a person it could be just the definition of the structure of an asset so I understood I was just wondering if you could like piggyback on the definition of a verifiable credential schema and just sort of overload that as a <laughs> yeah. definition yeah it brings a lot a lot of complexity because of the way that the the deeds are defined for verifiable credentials and here maybe uh we may be needing something which is more lean something uh, you know like a straight api where you can go and fetch data to be discussed okay we okay. can bring this in, uh, in the mailing list of course okay yeah, thanks all right uh anybody else with last questions otherwise we have a few minutes left for Raphael, which we should switch to all right thanks dennis appreciate it uh yeah. Raphael, do you want to share your own slides or do you want me to paul did you have a question nope <laughs> uh Raphael, uh, do you want me to oh. share your slides or do you want to do it let me see if i can share my screen Okay, you have asked to share it. Where is the permission? Oh, there it is. Should be. Yep, I see the request. Can you folks see my screen? Yep, yep you're good. Go for it. Thanks, Wes. Hey, everyone, a quick update. Uh, we've been working on uh, multiple implementations of set B at this point. Uh, I'd like to thank Andre for the help uh, on putting these sites together. Let's just dive into it. So at Hyperledger, we have two different proof of concept implementations of set B, set B Hermes and set B Weaver. Set B Hermes is implemented in TypeScript, whereas Weaver is implemented in Rust. It's currently uh, being reviewed as a pull request. So having different types of implementations is a good thing because now we uh, limit the damage if one of the implementations fail. It's a bit akin to the philosophy of having multiple implementations of blockchain node. Um, particularly, Rust is becoming a very popular language due to its, to its memory safety features and very high performance. Um, on the other hand, TypeScript is very popular. JavaScript is probably the most used language, programming language in the world and has a vast developer basis. So we believe that with both a widespread language and a very robust newer language, we can cover both type of uh, potential users, the ones that want to implement a faster POC and the ones who want to uh, to be more cautious, let's say. 
So the architecture is relatively simple. We have the client application like we have on the set P core draft figure, and then we have the API API one. This API one translates requests from the client's business logic into gateway, well, into gateway specific requests essentially, although that's done at the backend. So when we receive requests from API one, we this is by the way set P Hermes, the TypeScript implementation. We have a bunch of modules for modularization and so on, not particularly interesting to this, to this group. And then we have two core modules that implement the other API types. API 3, we call it the adapter layer. And, and then we have this gateway orchestration layer, which essentially translates API 1 requests into gateway specific requests and sends those requests to, to other gateways. In Hyperledger Cacti, we can um, spawn nodes that have the set P implementations running on these nodes, and we can also use the ledger connectors. So uh, between quotes for free, we get the set P functionality and the ledger connectivity functionality. The connection to, let's say, core banking infrastructure, financial services, and so on can be implemented as, as an adapter. So we get some sort of full stack solution. Um, this is a, a diagram in more detail you can access. I'll send the slide. So although API 1 is out of scope, um, we found necessary to define this API 1 because firstly, if we want client applications to interact with gateways, we definitely need to standardize it, standardize this sooner or later. And secondly, uh, to conduct our own POC and to evaluate it, we, we need this API. So the, the first idea was to define two sets of endpoints, one for more administration, administrative type of uh, endpoints, and another one for transactions. The transactions would, the transaction endpoints would be transact, cancel, get the supported chains slash systems, and get a list of routes for a specific transfer. Um, I believe the, the end vision uh, for this working group would be a, a network of gateways which can route transactions from one gateway to another gateway using different different number of hops, right? Um, on the other hand, we have the administration uh, endpoints which com comprises getting the status of the gateway, health check endpoint, continue or pausing a transaction. And of course, this will require a lot of discussions. Uh, but the key point here is that API 1, API 2 does not depend at all on API 1. So the the key the key trick is translating API 1 requests into API 2. Um, these pause and continue endpoints would require a change to the course. Uh, this is probably a discussion to have further down the line. Uh, for the moment, we support Fabric, Bezu, um, EVM-based chains. And uh, in the longer term, medium to long term, we want to support EPSI and other blockchains who have more binding character, let's say. Currently, we are refactoring set P. Um, we are planning to have an end to end working proof of concept by June, where we have crash recovery as depicted on the draft, on the crash recovery draft, audit and compliance tools. And this is uh, this audit uh, feature would depend heavily on what we have defined on stage zero. And what are the needs of, uh, what we think is useful for the gateway to expose to, to the outer world in terms of uh, traceability. Um, for, for this specific implementation, we also want to, uh, to develop uh, set the SDK, which is basically API 1, so in client applications can integrate with, with our protocol, and then a couple of, let's say, more long-term vision uh, functionalities, such as automatic incident response, detection and response. So also to increase the security, as was mentioned in this meeting. Uh, this development is open source. It's publicly available. Everyone can, can see it and can uh, have a discussion on it and contribute to it. We have a small GitHub project where we uh, show what's being currently developed. 
and the contribution to this code base follows open source practice practices and uh, follows the hyperledger guidelines which i think in philosophy are very aligned with the idea uh, a small a small detail and i'm almost finishing we we had a, a, a small difficulty in previous implementations uh, previous versions of the implementation which was at some point nobody really knew which version of the of the protocol we were implementing so to to fix that we are now including uh, some flags which refers which are the drafts that are implemented or being implemented such that uh, we know precisely what code are we running. Uh, so the current version that is being implemented is version two. And when this version is stable and implemented, we can update it to the latest version. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Feel free to ask me any, any doubts on the mailing list. Excellent, thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, two really quick things, but if anybody has questions, now jump in the queue. Um, yeah, I mean, versioning definitely needs to happen in the in the protocol definition itself. Otherwise, you know, you run into issues. The one question I had was, how closely were the what was the overlap between the teams that implemented the two different versions? One of the things that we run into in the ATF all the time is um, interpretation of a of a specification is is best. Uh, to be determined when like multiple completely different people are interpreting something. So you have two implementations, which is awesome. I assume they speak together well, um, but was were people on the same, were, were there people involved that were on both teams? I assume so. So when, when the set P Hermes implementation is led by Andrea August and myself, and uh, the Weaver implementation is, I would say, led by Rama and his colleagues at IBM. Although I've provided some uh, some guidance on that implementation, so I would say there is there is some overlap, but uh, at the end of the day, they are independent teams, independent awesome. implementations. Okay, fantastic, um, Paul. Yeah, I just have a closing remark. If there's no more questions on this presentation, uh, let me go to Rama first, and then you can have your closing remark. Uh, we can discuss it at length on the mailing list, but uh, I posted some links on the other implementation. Uh, I'd, I'd given a brief presentation in ITF 118. Uh, the, uh, so Rafael is being modest. I mean, he, he actually uh, was a key uh, mentor for the implementer for the Weaver uh, implementation as well. There, what we had were uh, modules called relays within Cacti, which are very similar to how we have positioned the gateways. So that's the kind of implementation. It, it's somewhat different from uh, 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 at least from a modular perspective, it's a little different from what uh, Rafael showed, but uh, it actually uh, has the end-to-end -end flavor of the protocol that we've been trying to uh, draft in SAPI code. Okay, thanks. Uh, Paul, uh, closing comments. I think we are going to close the meeting at this point. So, Paul, or area director of okay Power. yeah i'm speaking as the area director um i just wanted to uh, notify people that uh, we're changing things a little bit up so sat p doesn't technically fall under the security area um so it's um it's going back uh, well it, it remains in the area where it is an art area um and so it will become uh, the responsible ad will become ori steel and i will still be listed as like a technical advisor so i will still keep an eye out on everybody and everything um but uh the formal AD will become Ori Steel. And that's just nothing to do with set piece specific. It's just like um, sort of trying to keep the um, the ADs uh, within the area so that the scheduling for ITF meetings becomes easier. Yep. Uh, as, as thanks, Paul. Greatly appreciate all of your help getting us here. Uh, you were instrumental in making this working group even happen. Um, so I will certainly uh, talk with Ori as Claire and I both will, I'm sure. and. Um, Smooth transition. Basically, upper level management's changing. You know, the the pointy hat. Paul is going to step aside and let Ori take over. So, all right. Thanks very much. Any final comments? All right. Good meeting, all. Thanks very much. I will. I took some notes and I will post them shortly to the data tracker. So, um, thank you all, and we'll talk to you again. Claire and I'll work on scheduling another meeting in a month or so.